we just stand together and just pray? I think that'd be good, just as we receive the Word. And, and as in this series, um, as we've been hearing that we need to put on the armour of God and, and that God wants us to be strong. Do you believe that? And uh, we see that in the first passage in Ephesians 6. It says, be strong in the Lord and His mighty power. And I'm just so encouraged by that, that, that is God, what is God's will for my life is to be strong. It's to be strong in the Lord, to be strong in faith. And that when He calls us to something like that, He also equips us. He doesn't just leave us on our own, but He wants us to be strong. So why don't we pray into that as we receive the Word today and believe that He wants to strengthen us together. Do you believe that? And uh, that's why we're here. Lord, we just thank You that, that You are here. You are such a great resource to us that You haven't left us as orphans, but You have come and that You continue to work in our lives to strengthen us, to give us peace, to give us hope, to give us new life. And Lord, we need that today. We need Your new life. We need Your strength. And, uh, and so we draw upon it today. Speak to us by Your Word. And we give You this next half hour um, to be able to transform our life from the inside out. In Jesus' Name. Would you say amen with me? Amen. 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 What's well, been a great series on standing strong and, and looking at the armour of God and how we have this need to wear armour to protect ourselves from some of the forces, the oppositional forces that would come uh, against us. And uh, back when I was young, I, I dabbled in a little bit of um, cricket, loved playing cricket. Um, all round a bat, bowl and field, loved everything. And, uh, and I was a, uh, back then as a younger person, I was a pace bowler. And so I loved, often we'd get the, the new ball with the shiny lacquer on it the, at its most, you know, hardest. And uh, I would just love running in off the long run, delivering as fast as I can. It would spray everywhere, but as fast as I can. Uh, and I remember one time uh, bowling and, and sending down this demon of a delivery and it hit the wicket hard, bounced, and it took the batter by surprise, and it hit him right where it hurts. <laughs> and he dropped, he dropped to the ground. And, and, he, and he was out for a little while, writhing in agony. And, and then it became obvious, as people came to check on him, that let's just say he wasn't wearing all the available protective equipment that he'd come out to bat without one, of the most, without one of the vital bits of equipment, the protector. And, uh, and so we, we, would, we are foolish to go into situations without having all the necessary precautions, to have protecting our vulnerability. And each of us, we have general vulnerabilities, don't we? Um, that are common to us all. We face um, the same kinds of trials and temptations and opposition. But also, depending on our personality type, our own situations, we also have specific or particular vulnerabilities um, that um, where, where it might be different to the person next to you, they might be really strong in an area, but you might have a, a particular thing that you struggle with or are vulnerable to. And so my first point today as we jump into the armour of God is what's really important is number one, is that we know our vulnerability. Yes. Know our vulnerability. And so the context of the passage in Ephesians 6 that we've been in, Paul's saying, hey, I want you to know that you've got some vulnerabilities. I want you to know that you're up against um, some fast bowling that could clean you up and could do some damage to your faith. And so we need to know our vulnerabilities. We need to know our vulnerabilities. P praise God, I think that's my child. I love, I love having children in the service. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, one of my, I, I have many vulnerabilities. Um, oh, shock, I know, you're like, Sam, I think, I thought you were perfect. No, <laughs> many vulnerabilities. Um, as, as a younger, well, actually, as a younger person, one of, the, one of my real vulnerabilities um, was in the area of my eyes and my thoughts. And, and that was a vulnerability for me. So in, in picking that up, I thought, man, I've got to actually guard myself against this vulnerability. So I can't just do all the normal things. I actually, this requires me to put extra attention 
and to be on guard in a special way and fortify myself because I know this particular area is a weakness of mine. And so one way that I would do that is by having um, a program called Covenant Eyes. I would use for my screens and that would, would help um, what comes onto my screen. It would, it would help out in that way. Another thing that I did was have an accountability partner who would ask me how I'm going, would pray for me, and would stand with me. And I think, man, if that's one of our vulnerabilities, then we actually need to put things, extra things in place, not walk into battle hoping that it's gonna be all okay, thinking I'm gonna be strong enough, I'm gonna be doing, do it on my own. Actually, oftentimes, if we have a vulnerability, we need to go over and above to guard ourselves for the things that might come against us. I love what it says um, in Job. Uh, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes a commitment, a contract, a, a firm decision with my eyes not to look with lust on that young woman. Man, some of us need to do that. I need to do that. We all need to do that, make a covenant with our eyes. I wonder what vulnerabilities do you have? Another one uh, in, in my life that I've had to guard against and still have to guard against is to the whole thing of hearing but not taking action. Um, in James 1.6, sorry, in James, it says, James 1.22, it says this, we aren't to just listen to God's Word, you must do what it says. Otherwise, you're fooling yourself. For if you listen to the Word and don't obey, it's like looking into the face of the mirror. You can see yourself walk away and forget what it looks like. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free and do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. Wow, this is such a practical passage. And I love it, it says that, hey, one of, sometimes there is the battlefield of engaging with God's Word. Do you ever find that? When you go to, you, you think, oh man, I, I, need, I wanna be in the Bible, I wanna be getting the Scripture immersed in my life, I wanna be memorising it, I wanna be getting along to a, a, a weekend gathering um, where there's praise and worship, where there's the preaching of God's Word, all that stuff. And often we find, isn't it, when we wanna do those things, often there is that resistance. Resistance of the flesh, of thinking, oh no, there's a distraction, oh, there's a better thing, oh, I've got to clean, clean this over here, I've got to do this. And then we have that resistance and, and we can think that the battle is there and absolutely is. But then there's a battle after the battle. And one of the battles that we can often forget is the battle not just to engage with God's Word, but to actually put God's Word into action. C.S. Lewis talks about this whole area of activity and obedience in this famous quote from the screw tape letters. As long as a man doesn't convert, convert it what he's heard into action, it doesn't much matter how he thinks about this new repentance. Wallow in it, immerse yourself in it, write a, even write a book about it. That is often an excellent way to sterilise the seeds. I, I love that terminology. Sterilising the seeds which your heavenly Father plants in a human soul. Do anything but act. No amount of piety in his imagination or affections will harm the cause if it's kept out of his will. The more often he feels without acting, the less he'll ever be able to act. Man, this is often the battleground and often it is for me as well. Not just, not just to think when I come into a worship service or have a, have a devotional time with God and you get the feelings of your affections get stirred and that's why we come together and say, hey, we need to come together because it actually it stirs our affections. It stirs our desires and our motivations to wanna live for God. It actually does that as we sing, as we worship, as we hear His Word. But sometimes feeling those things and sensing those things can fool us into just having the right intentions. It can psychologically actually make us feel like we've done something already when we haven't. So the battleground there is, all right, Holy Spirit, I need your help not just to illuminate the Scriptures, not just to speak to me, not just to help me to get there, but now, oh Lord, I need your help to help me outwork this in my life. Oh, these things that you've now convicted me of, help me to walk it out in faith. Oh Lord, the, the promptings that you've put on my heart to go and help that person, bless that person, sacrifice and serve that person. Now give me the strength and the, the wherewithal to now do that in my life. We need to be doers and not just hearers. Another one, a vulnerability 
in, in my life is the area of doubt. I remember as throughout uh, my earlier Christian life particularly, and as a young leader, I would just be hit with, with waves of intellectual doubt in going through university and, in, and thinking through all the big questions of faith and being immersed in, hey, Christianity is not the, old, uh, the own philosophy, worldview, religion. There's all these opposing thoughts and ideas of how to live and the best way uh, that is true and right. And so these, these waves of doubt would come in. I remember it well. And, and you might have, and we all face this, I guess, at, at times, and it's that picture of being blown about as we see in James 1.6. It talks about that. When, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. It describes it this way, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed about by the wind. Man, I've, I've, have you ever had a time like that where you've just felt like you're being confused and tossed to and fro? And that has been a vulnerability in my life before. And when we are blown about by the wind, on the waves of life and doubt, do you know what we gotta do? You gotta throw down an anchor. That's what ships do. When they're wanting to, when they're wanting to arrest, um, being, being thrown onto the rocks and being shipwrecked, throw down multiple anchors and that anchor is designed in such a way that it actually grips into the seabed, grabs hold of something and it holds it firm so that it doesn't move any longer. And we need to throw down anchors in our life. I remember um, one, one way of doing that for me was sitting down with a pastor and just confessing it. Coming, I was a youth leader at the time and just saying, hey, I'm really struggling with, with this, this and this, these big questions, it's really doing my head in. And, and just, to, just to do that, just to sit down with somebody else and have them hear it and affirm it, it was like this anchor that stopped me going further and further back into that. It was an anchor. It was an anchor in my life. There are other anchors we can do as well. When we are facing times of doubt uh, and confusion, we need to feed our faith instead of fueling our doubt. In those times, there are resources, there are people, there are messages, there are scriptures that we can grab hold of that are gonna be anchors for us, that can stop us in our tracks. Plenty of resources like um, apologetic material with uh, that, that uh, ap apologies and, and make reasonable arguments. And when those times where sometimes you feel as a Christian that it's just like, am I, is, am I just an idiot? Am I believing stuff that's just fairy tales? And then sometimes you need to listen to resources and people who are smarter than you, authors and speakers who actually remind you, hey, actually this is a reasonable thing to believe in God. There is evidence that we can point to and that we can, that, and in those moments when we engage with that material, it's like an anchor in our life. It pulls us back into line. I think of, um, just to name a few, um, reasonable faith. Um, you can look that up. There are um, plenty of uh, great books and materials as well that you can get a hold of. For me, when I was going through those times of doubt, um, C.S. Lewis, again, his book, Mere Christianity, just reading it and just this, wow, this professor, this profound thinker, this well-developed mind and reading him and engaging with him was like an anchor for me. It started to build and feed my faith instead of fueling my doubt. I think we all go through times like that in our life, don't we? Pastor John Tyson from Church of the City, New York says this, there is no road to spiritual maturity that does not walk straight through doubt. That doubt is inevitable, but what we do with our doubt matters. And that God wants to form us and to strengthen us and to help us know more and to have a deeper understanding of the Christian truths so that we can stand against some of these doubts that can come our way. I wonder, where do you need to put your anchors down in your life? What are your vulnerabilities and how can you guard yourself, protect yourself, put on armour in those ways and be on guard so that you can stand. Let's jump straight into our Ephesians 6 passage and read again the armour of God in the New King James Version, which I like. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I love that. It's tricky. 
It's deceptive, the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of this dark age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may, may be able to stand on the day of evil, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. How important is having right thinking and right believing? Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. That is sometimes that we can realise the antidote to some of the enemy's attacks is to actually keep walking in God's way. Keep walking in obedience, keep doing what we know to be true and that we will stand firm. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And above all, taking the shield of faith, which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And today we are going to be looking at the helmet of salvation. At, at my home, Tanya tells me off. Um, the, the other day she came out where uh, me and the kids were on our road. Um, it's not a main road, I may add, it's a, it's a cul-de-sac and, uh, and the kids we're riding around on the road on their bikes, on their scooters and without helmets and Tanya comes out and she's like, kids, where are your helmets? Come back here and put your helmets on. Oh, Cause I'm definitely a kind of a helmets off kind of parent um, that I, f- I feel like that's a bit old school. And it's like, you know, they gotta learn somehow. They gotta toughen up. You know, kids these days are all weak. We've gotta to toughen them up. You know, the, the answer to the resilience problem of this generation is to, you know, they're not being, they need to eat dirt and get a few scratches. So they don't need helmets. And then, and Tanya comes out and, kids, why aren't you wearing your helmets? Dad said we didn't need to wear them. <laughs> don't listen to him, come and put your helmets on. And sometimes I think we can have a, a prideful attitude or a, or a laissez-faire attitude towards this life when things are going well, when we've sort of got it all together and we can think we don't need to wear a helmet. But of course, that can be true almost at times, but we can be lulled into a sense of security. And of course, the Bible is saying, hey, there's actually something greater going on. You have um, a, an enemy who wants to steal, kill and destroy. He wants to erode uh, and wants you to be powerless in your faith. And so we can be lulled into the times of think, oh, I don't need to read my Bible today. Oh, I don't, I don't need to join a ministry team. I don't need to serve God with my gifts and abilities. Oh, I don't need to go to that extra gathering. I don't need to, oh, I just wanna come along and, and let those words wash over me. I don't need to sing that out and declare and profess those things are true in my life um, when we come to a worship service. And and we can have all these things and think we can be lulled into a sense of security that we don't need to put on the helmet of salvation. But of course, there are times where we need it. We're in a battle. We need to put on the helmet. Don't do what I do with my kids. In fact, I think it's probably illegal to to do that on a a road. (laughs) Um, The famous saying says this about our mind and about our thoughts. Watch your thoughts, they become your words. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. And watch your habits, they become character. And watch your character for it becomes your destiny. We need to protect our head, don't we? We need to protect our thinking and our believing because that is where the battleground often is. And uh, I love... Um, Craig O'Shell, his latest book, Winning the War in Your Mind, he says, um, our, our life is heading in the direction of our strongest thoughts. That our thoughts matter, the beliefs matter. And, and we can sometimes think that, yes, I know enough to get us, get us through, but I'm like, man, now more than ever in our culture that is resistant and often um, not not respectful of Christianity, we need to put our roots deeper down into the Scriptures and Christianity and the knowledge of God. We need now more than ever. And so often I I go to Bible college and and hear the lecturers and unpack and do the assignments. I think this is amazing. It's strengthening my faith. Everyone needs to do this. And so my question for everyone is, it's not, oh, does God want me to go and do some sort of further biblical study? It's, of course He does. We should be all doing that, equipping ourselves. And if it's not university study, something else, books and resources, um, training that's gonna help us strengthen our faith. 
And we might have some pictures of um, the helmet, um, the, the Roman helmet of Jesus' day or Paul's day uh, as well. And in, in Latin, it was called um, the galea, the galea, uh, made of metal. Of course, it does what helmets do. It, it protected um, the brain from attack, but also um, the sides and the face and, and the, the neck plate so that it would predominantly stop the attacks from the broadsword. Um, for without the helmet, there was really no way of stopping it. And the enemy knew that if they could attack the head, it could disorient and confuse um, at best. But if they could attack the head, then every other part of the soldier's body, defence and attack would be rendered useless. So it is as Christians, if we can be um, rendered confused, disorientated, or wrong in our thinking and believing, so too do we become ineffective in our Christian faith. It was the helmet of salvation. So Paul talks about the helmet of salvation. We need to remember that God is our Saviour, that Jesus is our Deliverer. And I think partially he's talking about um, the initial moment of salvation, because there's three kind of tenses of salvation. And the first one, actually, we'll have that graphic up. The first one is what many of us here today have experienced, that moment of where we met Jesus, where we've seen who He is and we've repented and we've believed and we've received the free gift of salvation. So in that moment, we received salvation. We were saved because of Jesus. And we've got that passage there in Ephesians 2.8. For it is by grace... God's free gift that you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourself. It's not from your earning it. It's not about how good you could be. And we know this to be true. This is the beauty of the gospel. It is the gift of God so that no one can boast. So we see that upon upon receiving the free gift of forgiveness, just keep that up there, that we were saved. And there's times when, when when we trip up, when we stumble, when we doubt, when all these things come against us that we can question those things. And then when we question those things, of course, when we're questioning our faith, do you think we're gonna be sharing our faith? Not as much. And so the enemy wants to keep us questioning whether we (laughs) receive that initial salvation. And so we need to remember and stand firm and hold to those promises in the Scriptures that talk about this in 1 John 1, 9. It says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These are promises of Scripture in Romans 10, 9. It gives this assurance to us as well. If if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that is the seat of your love and affection and values and priorities, that God raised Him from the dead, then you'll be saved. But we need to remember that if we've done that, that we are safe and secure, that no one can snatch us out of His hand. And for some of us here today, you need to remember that. You need to hold tight to that. But then there's also the sense in which God is presently saving us. And this is the process of sanctification, that we have been saved and forgiven, but there's also the flesh, there are also temptations, there are also these attacks of the enemy from which we are still battling. And the good news for us today is that Jesus is saving us from these things, that He was our Saviour and He is our Saviour. And so we are not doing that on our own. And this, the, the passage there, talks about this in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We have, for those who have been saved, we have a new power in operation that we have been cleansed, the temple's been cleansed, we've been given God's power, empowering presence through the Holy Spirit that now Jesus is in us He is transforming us from the inside out. We have a new power in operation to be able to resist the devil, to be able to say no to the flesh and the tempting things that we are faced with and the evil, the sinful desires that we face. In the the midst of battle, um, you saw the 
the helmet, um, the helmet there that was shown up before, we'll just get the helmet up. For, the, for a normal soldier there, the, you see that it's got the, um, there are different types of helmet. And so this one here was the basic helmet, which would be a normal soldier. And then if we've got that picture of the other helmet, which would be used through a squadron leader or a centurion, uh, who would essentially be the leader. And in the midst of battle, you know what happens that you can be so focused, it can be chaos and confusing, just like it can be in our own Christian life. But in those moments, a soldier can hear and listen out for the voice of their squadron leader or have a look around and the helmet would actually give the identification of the leader so they would be able to know, all right, I'm feeling disorientated. I just gotta put my eyes, I've gotta find my squadron leader who's gonna give me the right instructions to be able to lead me forward. And so they would do that, they would look to their commanding officer to know whether to retreat, whether to know when to move forward, to band together. And the centurion would be in charge of leading the troops. How much more so in our Christian life that we have a squadron leader, we have a centurion, a great um, warrior who is fighting alongside us and with us like we heard last week from Pastor Cass, who we need to look to when we are in moments of confusion, in moments of struggle, in moments of wrestling, that we can look to Jesus as we see in that famous passage in Hebrews 12, that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of faith, that He is saving us. I remember so many times uh, in my life when I've just, I've been at my wit's end or facing a temptation which seems too strong to bear and to be able to pray and shoot up, shoot up one of those flare prayers and say, oh Lord, help me. I don't wanna give in to this right now. I'm feeling weak. I'm feeling weak that we know that not only have we been saved, but we also have a present rescuer who is sitting at the right hand of the Father, who is our good shepherd, who is there to protect us, who is there to strengthen us, who is there to help us in our present need. I wonder what, what temptations are you facing? What difficulties or weaknesses in your f- faith are you facing at the moment that you can call upon the warrior who is our rescuer and our deliverer, who is ready to rush in and strengthen and help? He is the good shepherd. We need to be protecting our mind. I wanna share this picture um, as I close. I might invite um, the band to to come and join me on stage. This picture um, of a sheep and that in ancient Israel, uh, obviously um, shepherding, sheep herding was was, uh, it was an agrarian society, farming and, and livestock rearing were, were some of the um, most common um, forms of uh, industry at the time. And, and so that's why the Bible talks in the language that it does about sheep and shepherds, that we are God's sheep, that we are His flock and that He's our good shepherd. And in Psalm 23, um, David, who was a shepherd, talks in this language um, as well. And, he, and then there was a bit towards the end of Psalm 23, it says, you, you anoint my head with oil. And that can have various meanings because kings would get anointed with oil as part of their inauguration as well. But also it was a practice that shepherds would do with their sheep. So what, would, what they would find is that there would be bugs and insects um, commonly that would buzz around the sheep's head that would infuriate them and that those bugs and insects would seek to um, lay eggs in the, um, the moisture of their nose and their ears. And so it would distract them, it would infuriate them. And so what the shepherds would do as a remedy was that they would point, pour or anoint the sheep's head with oil. And that would um, be enough to repel, repel those bugs from infuriating those things. And it also would double 
as a fact that they're in the thorn bushes and the, the bushes and trees that were around that the, the sheep would often get their heads stuck as they were feeding. But with enough oil around their head that they could easily slip out of being stuck. And so there would be an oil on their head. And what I wanna say to you today, I wanna preach a bit this morning that we have a good shepherd who not only laid his, his life down for us at, to once become saved and forgiven, but He's also the God and the Good Shepherd who continues to lay His life down for us. He continues to lay down in the gate and to fend off with His staff the enemies that would come against us and He anoints your head with oil. Do you need His anointing oil over your head today? Are there things buzzing around your life? Are there places where you're feeling stuck? And the good news today, because Jesus is your Good Shepherd and that we have the Holy Spirit, that there is no one who is too stuck that you can't get out. There is no one who is facing something that you can't get victory of because you have a Good Shepherd and a Jesus who has won the victory for you and He is in your corner and He is fighting for you and He has won the victory on the cross so that we too can walk in victory. Why don't we stand together this morning as we receive all that He has for us. What are you facing at the moment? Where are you struggling at the moment? Where are you wandering at the moment? Let's be God's people together who acknowledge our vulnerabilities. Because as Paul talks about, he says, His grace is made perfect in our weakness. So we can not, a, not hide our weakness, not pretend it's not there, not pretend to be strong, but actually boast confess and boast in our weakness and our vulnerability. Because it's when we know our vulnerability, we can draw upon His strength. Then when we can call upon our Good Shepherd, we can call upon our champion centurion to come and help us in our time of need. For we know that we have been forgiven and we have that assurance of salvation, that we have confessed that we have repented, we have received the free gift of salvation. We know that we have eternal life through Christ, that we know that the old has gone, the new has come, the new is here, that we have a new identity, that we now call Him Abba Father, and that we have this Holy Spirit as a guarantee of the inheritance that is to come. And we need to remember that today. We need to put that in concrete. We need to make that a tattoo on our mind and in our hearts that no matter what we've done or where we've gone or how we've wandered, that no one can snatch us out of His hand. And that in Hebrews it says that Christ died once for all, a once for all sacrifice for sin, that He has forgiven us of the things we've done, the things that we're doing today and the things we haven't even done yet, that we are forgiven through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus, that we can have confidence and assurance to walk as more than conquerors through Christ who loves us, that no one can separate us for the love that we have in Christ Jesus. Nothing, as it goes, Paul talks about that list. No matter, what, no matter what you're facing, nothing can separate us from the love that we have in Christ Jesus that we have been saved. But not only that, is that He is saving us, that we are being saved.